want you to grab your Bible. I'm going to jump right into this tonight. I'm humbled, thankful, honored to be standing in front of you tonight. I told doctor, I said, I kind of feel like the little cherry on top of the Sunday. Uh, not very thoughtful of him to have me in last. I think I should have been first. And uh, what great voices have stood on this platform this week. And I know that you are full to the brim. Anybody just feel full in him tonight? And uh, I just, I want to do my very best to dig just a little something out of three verses in Amos chapter 9. And... I want to just declare something. I'm going to, I, I don't know that I want to preach as much as I just want to declare something over this place. And I say this every time I'm here. You are lucky. You ought to pinch yourself. Amen. You get to come to church here. And uh, it's such an honor to stand in this pulpit. And I want to thank this great house for the hospitality, the love, the gifts. The hotel room, it's my favorite, my favorite hotel room, amen. And uh, uh, Pastor Steph was supposed to be here with me. She sends her hellos, and uh, she told me the other day, doctor, she said she's a lot like God in my life. And I looked at her, and I said, well, well what does that mean? She said, well, I'm three in one. I said, yeah. She said, yeah, I'm your wife, your girlfriend, and your woman on the side. And I know she's watching from Kentucky. Can you just tell hello to Pastor Stephanie tonight? Amen. Let's dig into this. Are y'all ready? All right, I want you to lean forward. I'm not going to be long, but I, I want to declare something into your heart, into the fabric of this place. Out of Amos chapter 9. Now, it's going to be scriptures you've heard and sometimes it's very difficult for us to learn stuff we think we already know. And, and I want you to just open your heart tonight. And because uh, I came to preach for this man of God. I, I, you know, you ever, I just feel like tonight God is going to release something into the fabric of this place. And I'm excited to share it. In verse number 11, Amos 9, verse number 11, your Bible says this, In that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. I will close up the breaches and raise up the ruins and build it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the heathen which are called by my name, saith the Lord, that doeth this. Verse 13, And behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes him that sow seed, and the mountains shall drop sweet wine, I like it, and all the hills shall melt. I want to just try to disperse out of one word tonight, and that word is accelerate can you just shout it with me on three one two three well that's that, that's kind of good I, I want you to shout it like you're expect fact is get your foot on out there come on you you heavy footers that are ready I want you to prophetically just get it out there because we're going to put it all the way to the floor tonight anybody ready for your whole life Come on, to get in acceleration mode. On the count of three, I want you to put the pedal to the metal, and I want you to prophetically declare it into your life on three. One, two, three. There you go. You may be seated. Mr. Sound Man, if you could just give me a whole lot right here. Amen. I want to talk about this word, accelerate. I believe that we are in a new season in God. Anybody feel that? Come on, talk to me up here. Anybody feel that? You are standing in a new season tonight. Well, your new seasons require new actions. Look at your neighbor and say, what are you about to do about it? 
Amen. Listen, we, we go into a place in God, but it requires that we step into some new activity. Can't pray like we used to pray. Can't sing like we used to sing. Can't serve like we used to serve. Can't come to church like we used to come to church. There has to be a shift. I watch people get words, but because their actions never change, they never receive the fruit of that word, and then they look at God like he's crazy. Look at your neighbor and say, what are you going to do about it? I plan on prophesying something into you your life tonight. But the reality is this. If it doesn't change the way you live, you're never going to step into the fruit of what God is trying to get into your spirit. You have got to do something about what God has dropped into you this week. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday night, last night, Pastor Sammy Rodriguez, and then tonight. There has got to be a remaking of the activity of your life. You have got to do... Oh, I feel Feel this thing already. You got to do something different if you're going to receive something different. And I believe we are in a season God is determined. I feel my help in here. Hallelujah. God is determined to move in the hearts of his remnant church. This is the season of the gathering of the eagles. And God is about to raise the level of a dispensation of grace in the house of God. And I want you to know I'm ready for it. Anybody else ready for it? Let's dig into this. If you're a note taker, let me give you a few notes tonight. First is this. New levels of glory require new levels of revelation. For us to take the next step in God, we've got to have a word that reveals it. I believe we have to have more than just the mere teaching of the word of God in this season. We've got to have a prophetic declaration. We have to have the prophetic voice that will pull the cover off what we have access to. Because I'm here to tell you, we've got access to more than we're living in. Talk to me, somebody. There's more available than we're stepping into. And as for me, listen, once that prophetic word reveals to me that I've got access to something, once I see that there are houses I didn't build and wells I didn't dig and vineyards I didn't plant, you can't talk me into staying where I am. You cannot talk me into sat being satisfied with less when I know there is more in store for me. My spirit cries, God, give us a new prophetic revelation of our access in you. Amen. I was in a hotel room in Chattanooga, Tennessee, taking my son to college, to Bible college. And it was a Monday and I was pretty tired and we'd worked in his little apartment, traveled all the way up there. I'd gone back to the room about 4.35 o'clock and I'd showered and I was in the I was in the uh, mirror brushing my teeth and all of a sudden I had a visitation from God. Amen. When I came to, I was in the fetal position on the floor in the bathroom sobbing and wailing as God withdrew. Amen. A groaning out of my heart. And I heard his voice in my ears as strong as I've heard it in almost 30. I celebrate 30 years of full-time ministry in February of 23. In 30 years, I've never heard it stronger. It woke up every fiber of my being. And the voice said this. It's time and begin to count down from 10, 9, 8. And I begin to shake under a steadfast expectation. Everything in me begin to wake up from that moment until now. The scriptures we just read have begun to unfold in my belly, showing me that we are not where we used to be. Can I preach in here just a minute? We are not where we used to be. And when the word comes, it demands different actions actions and it definitely demands different expectations I stand in front of you tonight I want you to know something I am expecting something to be released in this place I am expecting something to rain on the dry season in your life I expect you to leave here differently than you came I need somebody to just praise God about 10 seconds if Hallelujah. 
Pastor Bagwell was with us. And he began to prophetically declare into our place. I was home in the afternoon between services. And I got in the floor with God. And I heard that voice again, Dr. Bagwell, it's time. Ten, nine, eight. Listen, we can't live like we got all the time in the world. We are the bride of the living Christ, and it is our time now. It is our turn now. It is our season now. And we need a voice that will pull the covers off what God is doing in this moment so that we can be full participants. Somebody shout yes. Your Bible says in Amos 3, 7 that God does nothing unless he reveals it to the prophets. And understand this, it's the word that reveals access, but it's our response that leads to possession. You don't get it because he said it. You get it because of your response. To look at your neighbor and say, what are you about to do about it? See, because some of you in here will hear God's voice. But because you do not respond to that voice, you will not reap the fruit of what God is trying to bring you into. Listen, when the word comes, it says, everywhere the sole of your foot shall trod. That I'm going to give to you. You know what you got to do? You got to start stepping, baby. You can't stay where you are. You got to let your faith move your feet into the land that God has promised you. Amen. So we think we get a word and then God just going to rain it out of heaven without us changing anything. Let me tell you, it'll change everything before he changes anything. You're going to have to move into the promise of God because we can't speak those things uh, that are not as though they are until the word reveals that they are. Amen. We've got, to, we've got to have a word of prophetic declaration. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 says, I has not seen, ear has not heard. It's not entered into the heart of a man the things God has in store for those that love him. But I like this part. But God has revealed them through his spirit for the spirit searches all things. Can I tell you there is a spirit that is revealing the access that the people of God have in this season. Who's ready to step into it? Amen. Let me get into this. Amos chapter 9. There's three things that Amos is pointing to in this text. Those three things are this. Let me just lay them out there in case I don't preach them all. The first is this, a specific time. He said, in that day. Everybody say specific time. Then he talks about a specific purpose. In that day, I will rebuild or raise up the tabernacle of David. And then thirdly, he talks about a specific anointing. The anointing of acceleration where reapers begin to overtake sowers. Amen. In that day. I want to focus on that specific time. You need to understand that God is the maker of days. David said, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Can I tell you, if he made this day, he's going to make that day. What day you talking about, Pastor? That day you get healed? He's going to make that day too. That day your prayer gets answered. He's going to make that day too. That day he delivers your child. If he made this day, come on, talk to me, church. He's going to make that day. Here's my question. Here's where my faith has struggled. When is that day? Talk to me. Help me now. Come on. When? See, I, I, can, I can receive the word with gladness. I can receive the word with faith. But the problem that my faith struggles with is not if he can do it. When are you going to do it? Anybody else with me in here? Anybody else? Because I've been wounded over this win problem. I'm going to talk to you plain as a preacher tonight. As a pastor, I've been wounded over win. 
I've had my spirit grieved over when I believe you can I have no problem believing you're the God of the universe you spoke and everything that is appeared but here's what I need to know when are you going to do what you promised you would do in my life my question is when is that day who decides when it's that day here's a better one could today let me work on this Luke chapter 4 Jesus is in Nazareth and he goes to church and your Bible says he stands up to read Just making sure it's not a filing cabinet. Okay, watch this. And he begins to read in the book of Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Amen. To speak healing to the brokenhearted. To preach the acceptable day of the Lord. To preach liberty to the captives. I mean, he's preaching up a storm out of the book of Isaiah. Then your Bible says that he closes uh, the book. And he goes and he sits down. Hallelujah. The problem is he sat in the someday chair. Uh, they've been saying someday the Messiah is going to sit in that chair. How many of you got a someday chair? Now y'all better help me preach in here. Someday he's going to do it. Someday what I prayed for is going to come to pass. Someday my family's going to get the healing it needs. Someday God's going to be, he's going to work a breakthrough. But the problem was, amen, he looked at them and said, this day is this scripture fulfilled I want to ask you what's the difference between someday and today everything I'm about to preach hinges on this what's the difference between someday and today I'll tell you who you think's sitting in that chair because if it's him pastor some days come on if it's him someday if it's him I don't have to wait on my healing if it's him I, I don't have to wait on the fulfillment of my promise if it's him I don't have to wait I can receive by faith today they had been waiting for centuries and generations for the Messiah to sit in that chair and when he sat down they did not recognize who he was this is the problem with the modern church when he came out of the ground you know the first person to greet him Mary can I tell you women something you better get ready ah the women you better get ready but watch this in the first garden he told the first woman Eve he said don't touch the the tree but she touched it in the second garden he said don't don't, don't touch me because I still gotta go sit down and once I sit down every promise is today once I sit down faith is now once I sit down the answer is no longer coming I need about 15 people to praise God you're not waiting on nothing you're standing in the middle of it all oh, I want to preach this I need about 50 people to praise God. You're standing in the middle of your end. If it's him, it's now. I want to be honest with you. My heart had been broken over something. It was a dumb thing. 
in the grand scheme of it all, it was silly. But I was heartbroken in the waiting. Now, I'm talking to some people in here who, if you dig right down, you're wounded in the waiting. Who am I talking to? Where are you? Where are you? I don't, Pastor, I don't want to be bitter, but, and I come and I'm faithful. And listen, I stood in my pulpit and I preached God's word with everything in my heart, but I was mourning in the waiting. Can I tell you, you don't have to wait anymore because if it's him, if he's the one, if he's who he said he is, if that's Messiah, you're standing in the middle of it right now. What you need to do is praise him. The wait is over. No, I need about 50 people to praise him. The wait's over. Now I'm healed. Now my children are saved. Now my blessing has been released because it's him. I know it's him. Hurry. I, just sit down. I got to hurry. I got 15 minutes. You keep clocking me. In, this is when things from my whole life begin to turn around. Pastor Aaron, can I just declare over you, stop waiting. Start praising. You're standing in the middle of it all. Terry, you're not waiting on nothing, baby. If it's him, and I know it is, if he's the one to make it all new, if he's the one to set it all straight, and I know it is, you're not waiting on anything anymore. I'm standing in the middle. I need somebody to praise God for that right there. I'm I'm going to dance in the middle of it. I'm going to praise in the middle of it. I I'm going to quit that. In that day, that day's today. Someday just became. <sighs> Whoo, man, that's almost too good, isn't it? Hallelujah. Some of you are going to get healed in your heart tonight. He was bruised for your transgression. No, bruising, that's bleeding on the inside. You don't have to be bruised and mourn in the waiting when you know it's him sitting in the seat. Amen. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David. I want you to see this because this is the specific purpose of this season. This is the specific time. Just shout, it's time. Oh, I hear that all over my spirit. It's time. When you stop waiting and just start receiving by faith, it's time. I shout it into the depths of your soul. It's time. When, Pastor, now, that's when. Hallelujah. I will raise up the tabernacle. The first thing is this. This is not the doing of men. This is not about programs. This is not about our wisdom putting together plans. What I'm about to preach to you is the doing of God alone. Unless the Lord build the house. Shela baka yombundebe. They that labor, labor in vain. Hear him tell Peter, upon this rock, I will, I will, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I feel like shouting and I need to preach. I want somebody to give God praise that he's about to do a thing and it's going to be a wonder in our eyes. He's about to build his tabernacle again. But watch this. Because this is not a tabernacle made of stone and mortar. He's not talking about buildings. He's talking about people. 
he said I am about to build the tabernacle of living stones they're not going to look alike they're not going to uh, smell alike hopefully they don't smell too bad come on somebody this is a tabernacle specifically of worshipers come on somebody listen no, 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 come on because we, we built, built big buildings that does not constitute a move of God but God said I'm about to rebuild the tabernacle of David I am about to bring together worshipers are there any worshipers in the room tonight I can't hear you I said are there any worshipers in the room tonight <laughs> slap your neighbor a high five and say I'm glad you're here Oh, come on, programs and strategies are not going to get this done, but God himself is about to build a tabernacle for his glory. Amen. And these, listen, these are not church attenders. No one church is all his church, but there's some of his church in every church. I'm not talking about people that come to church on Sunday. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about worshipers. Why have we reduced church to attendance? I go to church. Oh, what a sad eulogy for the glorious church we were supposed to be. We go to church. When God gets done, we're going to be the church. So wherever we are, at work in a cubicle, walking down the grocery aisle, shopping at the mall, we are the church. Oh, I feel like preaching this thing. When Jesus encountered the woman at the well, he said, the hour comes. It's a coming. And then he stopped and said, let me rephrase that. And now is. This happened. Listen, I'm tired of pushing off to tomorrow what God's trying to get done today. You've been pushing it off in your life trying to keep his hands off of the clay of your spirit can I tell you somebody's about to say a wholehearted yes tonight put your hands all over me I want to be part of David's tabernacle I want to be a worshiper not a church attender hallelujah hallelujah and you understand that the tabernacle of David instituted a new pattern of worship it was different than the pattern that was instituted by the tabernacle of Moses. You see, in the tabernacle of Moses, amen, only the priests could get into the holy place. Only the priests participated on behalf of the people. There was no access. But can I remind you, when they stranded him between heaven and earth, when they stretched his hands and they mutilated his body until he poured blood out of a thousand wounds and they put a thorny crown on his head and stuck a hole in his side and forthwith came blood and water when he declared it is finished I want to declare to you that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom and we now have access I need somebody to thank God. I don't need nobody to get to him. I don't need a choir to get to him. I can get to him in my bedroom. I can get to him in my closet. I feel God in this place. It was a pattern under Moses that demanded continual sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats turned the wrath of God for a year at a time. But they had to go again, and they had to go again. But I read in my Bible, he went in once. Talk to me, somebody. Because the blood still has its power. The blood still reaches. I want to preach it here to the highest mountain. And the blood still flows to the lowest valley. This blood I'm talking about has power to heal, power to save, power to deliver. The sacrifice is still true. Yeah. 
under the old system of worship. Only the high priest and only once a year could he go into the Holy of Holies. So the most important room had the least amount of access. Oh, but I just read today, Sheila Bashtehi, where Jesus said, come boldly. Hey, into the throne of grace. You don't have to wait on nobody. You don't even have to be in church. You can call on him from your bedroom. You can be standing in your kitchen and you can run into the holy place. Touch your neighbor and say, there's a different pattern. This new pattern that David would institute on Mount Zion, hear me because I'm going someplace, would be a pattern marked. (laughs) Oh, I want to preach this thing by the pursuit of God's presence. Oh, I want to preach this to you. Amen. 24 hours a day off Mount Zion came the sounds of worship. Shetabashay. Pursuit. The first thing that David did as king, you know what he did? He said, I got to go find the ark. There's going to be a remnant bride. It says, I don't care about the lights and I don't care about the worship leader. I want to know, is he here? And if he's not here, I'll push through the crowd because I got to touch the hem of his garment like the deer that pants after the water. My soul is so lit up with passion. I want him. You know what I see? This past year, man, God has opened up doors for me to be in places And my heart is so stirred for the bride of Christ. Man, because we attend church like we're at the movies, man. Oh. That's why I run more people off than I keep, my God. I don't understand it, man. This ain't the lazy boy. This ain't the man. You you ought to be back up saying, God, where are you at? I want to be where you are. Listen, if he's in this corner, I'm going to tell you this. I'm not sitting where I'm at. I'm going to go find him. Where is he? Where are you? I've got to have you. Church hasn't fixed me. I got in the shape I'm in. Going to church. Only his presence fixes what's wrong with me. And we come without seeking. We come without pressing. Our praise has no passion. Don't don't hear me scold you. Hear me love you into something deeper. You don't have to praise him like me. You don't have to sweat and spit all over the front row. That's not what I'm saying. But man, there's got to be a response of some kind. Like the woman with the alabaster box. She had never been to a praise symposium. She hadn't been taught and modeled what worship looked like. But when she got in his presence, she broke the box and said, You can have it all. You're worthy of it all. There is a remnant bride, a tabernacle of David that will chase him again. Amen. Amen. I want you to see this because this is interesting to me. There was 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year. They never stopped singing. You know what this is calling for? We have two hour a week worshipers. Help me preach when I'm preaching good. I know you're stuffed. Make some room. I'm about to put some more in there. Two hour a week worshipers. And act like we're going to get God and everything he wants to give like that. And I tell you, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what he's building. He's building some people that on Monday, they're still singing his praise. On Tuesday, 
when all hell's breaking loose they're on their knees breaking their box I'm talking about this demands a life of now watch this God allowed for the old pattern to exist even when David planted the new pattern. Dr. Bagua didn't know this, but in Gibeon, the tabernacle of Moses was still set up and they were still going through the motions. They were still offering their sacrifices. But the ark had been moved to Zion. You know what's going to happen? God's going to let a church keep going through the motions. If that's what you want, go ahead. But I'm calling a people to Zion. If you want the presence and the power and you want the miracles and you want the supernatural and you want the glory to fall in waves where the priest cannot stand to minister, you're going to have to get to Zion. Zion is calling. Zion is pulling us from traditions and religion. To a life of worship. We have been sequestered in church services where God, when God is trying to pull us to Zion into a life of worship. When's the last time you were up all night as he pulled a groan out of you? Since August the 15th, I have watched this happen. I have seen this, this month is the reason I got this shaggy, gross beard. I apologize. I'm not a face hair person. But at our church in November, we do Nazarite November with the men. Fasting, prayer, and consecration for 30 days. I have never in my 30 years of ministry and my 51 years of life have I seen men cry out to God like I'm watching it happen right now? I'm not preaching to you something I hope happens somewhere. I'm living in the middle of this right now. I'm telling you nothing could happen. Nothing moved. And then everything happened everywhere all at once because I got a vision of the one sitting in the chair high and lifted up. And I stopped waiting on anything let the worshipers arise let the sons and the daughters sing can I tell you God is building the tabernacle of David talk to me somebody do you know what happened on Mount Zion I'm a hurry I gotta quit Mount Zion became the governmental capital of Israel you know what that means that's where laws were made when God pulls his bride to Zion and we stop having church services and we start being the church, we, start, we stop attending worship and we live lives 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year that are absolutely given to his service and his attention alone. We will be raised to the place where we speak those things as though that are not as though they are. I'm ready for authority to return to the household of faith. I need to talk to some people that are ready for what is bound on earth to be bound in heaven. Oh, throw your hands up and say, take me to Zion. Here's my yes. I've kept myself for myself for so long. It's time for me to give it all. Let me just say this. Without worship, there is no authorship. You know why Adam had authorship in the garden? Because he walked with him. 
in the cool of the day there was relationship when he breathed out God breathed in everything he was thought everything he intended and purposed was lived through a relationship with the Father. And when God needed to name stuff, he didn't even take the time to do it. He said, Adam, come over here. At whatever you see, just name it. Whatever comes to your mind. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm ready for authorship to come back into the house of faith. We have been under the boot heel for so long, we forgot what it was to live in authority with God. I gotta quit. I haven't even got to the text. I'm seven minutes over right now. Verse 13. Okay, we'll be on California time. Look in your Bible. I want it to burn like a brand into your soul. Listen, until you get a vision, oh, I pray for this. King of glory, fill this place. Give us a vision like Isaiah. We got to see you so we know who's sitting in the chair. Because if it's you, some days today, and when you begin to rebuild this, you all better get ready. For some folks don't look like you to come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Hallelujah. Come on in. Come on in. Throw the back doors open. He's building his house. This is not our programs and our schemes and our plans. This is Jehovah God bellowing to the nations. Come unto me all ye that are weary and I feel like preaching in here that are weary and heavy laden. Come on in. Come on in. Let me get where I came to preach. Watch this. Reapers specific time in that day when you get a revelation of who's in the chair. This is the whole problem with the modern church. We're serving a God, but we don't know which one. Doctor, you know when Paul was in Athens and he saw the inscription that said, to the unknown God? You better be thankful for an angel that shows you his face. Because the modern church is worshiping the unknown God. I don't know about you, but I want to know him. I don't want to go through the religious motions and the traditions and all of the pomp and circumstance. I want to know him. I want to see him high and lifted up, train filling the temple. I want to know that when I call, he's not only able, but he's willing to move mountains on my behalf. Who is this king of glory? The Lord God's strong and uh, I got kind of I got to get back over here. Specific time, specific purpose to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Can you imagine a tabernacle of worshipers? Every tie, tribe and kindred and tongue. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Hallelujah. Rebuilding a place of worship. Not a place of ritual. Oh, I think we need to rethink it all. Because if he is not the purpose, we're going at it wrong. When you come in here and you wait on somebody else, stop waiting. This altar's open. Who you chasing? Who you looking for? This altar ought to be full before the first note of music ever strikes. I don't care if you don't sing or not. I'm going to get in his presence. I will bow before my maker and I will touch the hem of his garment. It's him I'm looking for. Amen. And he says then, 
I'm going to release the anointing of it. Get your foot out there. You ready? Acceleration. You've been trying to make something happen. Get out of my way. You've been trying. Oh, you've been trying. Watch me when I release something. And it's not about you trying to make something happen. You got to just get out of the way and watch it. Watch me work. Are you with me? Watch this. I want you to hear the language. Because God's been working on me. I don't have all this together yet, Aaron. But piece by piece, he's putting it in me. Reapers, Brother Mike, will overtake. Come here. You're a sower. Stand right here going this way. I just love you. Sheta by kilo. I just pray that the oil of anointing and all the service and all the years and all the faithfulness would just be poured out in a measure of grace-filled favor. You don't even know what to do with Come here. Watch this. Overtake insinuates something coming from behind. Stand right here. We have always taught. I have taught this for 20 years. Seed Time, come here, Mr. Harvest, Harvest, come here, old beardy beard, <laughs> over here. See, this is the chronology of our revelation to this moment. Seed, time, harvest, you with me? So the harvest is always in the future. Someday. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm. But when we get in this moment, the chronology of the harvest becomes God's timetable. Not mine. And so all of a sudden, the sower sows the seed. But instead of the chronology of the seed being time, then harvest. The harvest overtakes the sower. What? what, what? So I'm not chasing the harvest. The harvest. Watch this. Stay right here. Here's the way Jesus began to preach. See, you understand that everything in Scripture is both history and prophecy. I don't have time to teach this, but Dr. Bagwell... He'll help straighten all this out for you. <laughs> Everything in the word is both historical and prophetical. I don't know if prophetical is a word, but it... Come on. I'm getting a little drunk now. I probably need to go. <laughs> Hallelujah. Here's what Jesus said. Here's the way he began to preach the kingdom. See, and all of the mysteries of the kingdom are hidden for us, not from us. For specific moments in time. You know what he said? He said, repent, which means what? For the kingdom is at... Oh, so what you've been chasing... David saw it like this. Surely... Come on, y'all ain't with me yet. You're not catching this yet. Surely... Goodness and I've been trying to get goodness and I've been trying to find mercy. But when I looked at the rear view mirror, can I tell you, you better get you a sign. Objects in the rear view are closer than they appear. Your harvest is chasing you down. Sit down just a second. Don't go far.
Can I just have five minutes? Well, you've had enough ministry this week, for God's sakes. I just want to, I just want to get this in you the way I see it. Matthew 20. Jesus tells a parable. <coughs> you don't have to turn there. If you can't trust me, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Matthew 20. Jesus tells a parable about the householder. He goes forth early to hire laborers. And he negotiates with those laborers a wage of one penny a day. Oh, I want you to catch how precious this is. Are you with me? This is us. Right here, right now. Us, us, us. This is us. Then he goes at three and hires more laborers. And with those laborers, he says, at the end of the day, I'll pay you what is fair. Then he goes at six and he goes at nine and he goes at 11. Early, three, six, nine, and 11. The first laborers he hires, he says, I'll give you a penny. The next four generations of laborers, he says, I'll give you what is fair. The story goes that at the end of the workday, he pulls all of the laborers from the field. Oh, can I just tell you, get ready. There is a great getting up morning coming when the labor is over. That's why we got to work while it's day because the night comes. Nobody works because we're going to see the king. If you hadn't heard it in a while, let me tell you, the rapture of the church is imminent. We are in the 11th hour as we speak. You better stop playing games with God. You better stop playing fast and loose. You better stop attending church and start becoming the bride of the living Christ. Okay, watch, watch this. Watch this. He calls them all in. And he begins to hand out the wages. Pastor Eric, you know where he starts? With the laborers he hired last. You've been working all day. You came on at three. You came on at six. You came on at nine. I came on at 11. And when he goes to hand out wages, guess what I get paid? And here's the whole deal. I've been working one hour. Now, I'm a pretty good brother. But if I'm digging ditches for eight hours while you're licking lollipops and you get the same paycheck I, I get, as good a Christian brother as I get, I, I try to be. I don't know how good I'm going to put up with that. Who's with me? Come on, talk to me. Babe. Come on. Uh, come on, that'd be hard for me. I work all day and you work one hour and our paycheck is the same. So he pays the 11th hour labor a penny. The early laborer begins to cry out, how can that be fair? We know God to be a just God. And if you work eight hours and I work one hour and my paycheck is the same as yours, I think we can both agree that's not fair unless I'm missing something. The only way it would be fair for me who worked an hour to get paid the same as him who worked eight hours if I had a special anointing to accomplish as much in Let me get deep. We're the 11th hour laborers. And can I tell you the harvest that's coming is the greatest of any generation. The harvest. Because the anointing of acceleration is coming upon the household of faith. The bride is about to be yoked with an anointing to accomplish in one hour. Stay standing with me. 
Just let me give you a few nuggets. Because he only had me for one night, you know. Watch this. Pastor Eric, this is so profound. But the anointing of acceleration unlocks the principle of inheritance. You understand inheritance. In one minute, all you've got is what you worked for. And the next minute, you got all your daddy worked for. One minute's time. I watched. When you're ready for me to quit, just kick me off the way. I watched Dr. Bagwell, Miss Gala, my two boys two weeks ago preach for pastor appreciation. I just didn't want one of those services where the, you know, they spent three, because we have three Sunday morning services where I had to sit there and listen to how great I was for three services. I just couldn't do that. I said, you know what I want this to be? I want it to be a legacy day. I want my daddy to preach the nine o'clock. I want Colin, my oldest son, who's on my full-time staff and our youth pastor, just turned 22 years old last Friday, Saturday. Amen. He's the most beautiful, godly, perfect. I have no idea how he's my son. No idea at all. And then I, Stephanie, you're right, because she's all that and a bag of chips. And my 18-year-old firebrand, oh, he, doctor, I know how my daddy felt now turning me loose in the pulpit. I was scared to death. You talk about a wild man. He's wild. He just believes for everything. So courageous. I watched those two boys step out on that platform to packed houses, not a seat in the room. And I watched them step into a generational anointing and start reaping where they did not sow. I'm talking about a wave of the anointing of deliverance on pastor appreciation hit our house. The 1030 altar service lasted all the way into the 1230 service. The 1230 service lasted almost to three o'clock. Afterwards, I got on my knees in front of those boys and I said, you need to understand what you just stepped into. Your Choctaw chief grandpa who preached the gospel for almost 70 years. The last time I was in his presence when he was alive, I walked into his little house where he was seated on his lazy boy recliner with his Bible spread across his lap. The pages of that Bible had yellowed from the oils off his hands. I'm talking about a scary man. I got saved every time I went over to his house before I got there, just like I do when I come here. (laughs) I told God on the airplane in first class, if there's anything in there, tell me first. I do not want doctor to point it out, please. I felt that same about chief. He had a look in his eye that he could look right through you. And I remember him pulling me over to the hearth of the fireplace and putting his seat down where our knees almost touched. And he looked at me in the eyes and he said, there's going to be a day when you give one altar call. And you'll win more people to Jesus than I have in over 65 years of ministry. And I just sat there with tears running down my face. And I said, why, granddad? He said, because it'll be time. And on August the 15th in a hotel room in Chattanooga, I heard God, Dr. Bagwell say, it's time. Where the principle of inheritance where all I got one minute's what I worked for. And the next minute, I get everything he worked for. You know what, you know what the anointing does? It shrinks time. 
You want me to prove it to you? You break your arm. You go to the doctor, they put it in a cast six weeks later. You go back to the doctor, they cut the cast off, your arm's healed. What happened? Time. You take that same arm to the elders of the church. They anoint you with oil. Shayla Baha. And God heals your arm. What happened? The anointing. Strength time. The anointing of acceleration is hitting this room. I feel it all over me. I feel it all over me. Last thing, I'm going to quit. Because this one was a big one for me. As God spoke this to me, I, I, have, I have groaned over this thing. There's a place where God says, I will redeem the time the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm is stolen. If you're in this place and you've ever felt like you wasted time, run to this altar. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Don't, don't even think. Just come, 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 come. Come, come, come. I want you to watch this. Because you know what I was mourning? This gala. What I felt. I'm sorry. I was mourning what I felt was wasted time. Come on. Come on. You know the story. I'm not going to go into it. It's not for everybody to know, but I groaned. I mourned. In some small way, I found myself bitter before God for time I felt like was being wasted. And as God has moved me into this revelation, this has been a living thing with me and our ministry. It's not through yet. Hallelujah. God spoke to me. I want you to hear this. This is for you. And he said, the only reason time is valuable. And you know what we say? Time is our most valuable commodity. Isn't that what we say? Talk to me. God spoke to me and said, why is time valuable? And like a good son, I didn't answer. Because when you don't know the answer, you just shut your mouth. And he said, time is only valuable because of the opportunities hidden within it. So when I redeem time, I'm not talking about putting 20 years on the end of your life. I don't want to live 20 years longer than I'm supposed to, for God's sakes. I can't hardly get out of bed now. Here's what he said. I'm going to take the opportunities you thought you missed. And I'll fold them over the time you got left. You're about to walk into an opportunity rich environment. I'm talking about walking through four doors at the same time. Not just one door. Look up here at me. Look up here at me, sweetheart. Your morning's over. I wish I was going to be here Sunday because when you show up, you're going to have a smile like you hadn't had in a long time. I want to tell you something. I can't lay hands on everybody. It's Tuesday night. It's 9 o'clock. Wednesday night. Sorry. Redeem the time, Lord. <laughs> the gifts are all over this place. They're awake. They're alive. But I just want you to understand what you are standing in the middle of right now. I want you to soak it up with every fiber because what it's going to take is two things. Because you don't get to this accelerated move God wants to release until two things happen. Number one, you get a revelation of who's sitting in the chair. This has to be the cry. We got to see him as he is again. These versions of God, how we've weakened him and put him in a box. We need to see El Shaddai. We need to see Yahweh. 
Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sid Canoe, Jehovah Shama. We need a vision of you again, oh God. A vision that makes our problems seem small instead of our mountains seeming so big. That's it, honey. Just cry out. He's here. That's what everybody at the altar ought to just be crying out. But watch, we'll get there. But watch this. We got to see him first. And secondly, a real yes to a lifestyle of worship. We have kept back part of the price. God just spoke this through me over our church. And I'm telling you, there's been such massive deliverance. I, I'm telling you what, there is a spirit of deliverance loosed in the earth. The last two years have clouded even the people of God with spirits we have got to be released from. But God spoke this thing through me through that story in Acts of Ananias and Sapphira. They sold out and kept part of the price. And you know what? That's an entire church generation with their mouth said, we sold out. But we've kept back part of the price. Part of your yes. Because in the closets we've got secret things and hidden agendas. And habits and addictions. And things we've allowed to linger in the household of faith. Can I tell you worship will bring you back to righteousness and holiness before the Lord. There has to be a wholehearted yes. And you know what? All of this, we're going to stand in the back, have people close their eyes, and barely lift our hand to acknowledge that we're the ones that need prayer. Those days are over. They're over for me. I want people coming out of the closet in front of everybody. And so I want to ask you, how many of you can say, Pastor, you're talking right at me because I've kept back part of the price. I want to see your hands. Raise them. Part of my yes. I've said I've said yes, but part of my yes, I kept for myself. Pleasure seeking. My agenda, my dream. Man, we're chasing stuff, and when it falls, we look at God like He failed us. He never loosed us toward that aim. He never released us toward that target. And until we say yes, but when we see Him, and we say yes, and God can make us a brick in the house, in the tabernacle of David, He is going to release us into a season where what we've been chasing past Mike starts chasing us down I don't have a t time to go into this but I'm just trying to layer some of this because I'm not preaching something I, I hope happens man I'm living in the middle of this I could not get this building to move for nothing I fasted for weeks starved myself to flipping death I prayed until I couldn't, I didn't have a, a voice to preach weekends in my church. God, please move this thing. I was grieved because it was so much time and we've been stuck in this crackerjack box of a building and people sitting on top of each other and I have to preach three times and I love church, but for God's sakes, preaching like I preach three times in a row, I don't know how long I, I, I can stand up to that. I'm just being honest, right? This is just me and my flesh. I couldn't get it to move. I heard no after no after no. I couldn't get the new thing to appraise. And watch this. I got a phone call from my best friend on the planet. He lives about 50 minutes from my house in Lexington. We've been best friends since childhood. He was engaged to my sister. They didn't get married. Thank God that didn't work out. But anyways, we were so, we, we've been best blood brothers, man. God's really blessed him. He called me, doctor, and he said, what's going on with your project? And I broke down in tears. I cried. I said, I can't get it to move. 
and I, because we're best friends, I could be honest with him, like, because yeah. he's not in my church. Yeah. <laughs> you can't be honest with your church people. I had to get up and lead strong. Like, I broke down and cried, and I said, I can't get it to move. And it's broke my heart in a thousand pieces. And he said, well, let's build it. I said, well, I'd love to do that. He said, well, let me tell you what I just did. Because when God wants to get you a tea set, he'll move China if he has to. Mm -hmm. He said, I just bought 10% interest in Eclipse Bank. And you know where Eclipse Bank? It's a Louisville-based bank. He said, the doors are open. Let's build that building. Watch, here's what I'm trying to tell you. Nothing, no, and then everything, everywhere, all at once. And I'm just telling you one thing in a, about a jillion things. I'm gonna lay my hands on you. Your morning's going to be over. Your yes is about to get easy. And listen to me, if you'll get in the Bible and you'll spend significant time on your knees, you're going to get a vision of the one in the chair. And your dream's going to be his dream, not yours. And it's going to happen so fast. I want to hear the testimony. I don't know who this girl is, but I want to hear the testimony. Six months from now, if you, if you will press baby, if you'll get healed from the inside out, if you'll let God break the chains and the little things and the little insignificant hangers on, I'm telling you that in six months, your life is about to be an absolutely different picture than it is today in the name of Jesus. Can I get 50 people to give God praise right there? Thank you for joining our service today. In order to rewatch this service and not miss future services, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Are you looking for more information on Word of Life Christian Center? Visit us at wolcc.net, Facebook or Instagram. If your life was impacted by today's service and would like to support the work of the ministry here at Word of Life, You can give by simply going to wolcc.net and pressing the Give tab. You can also give on our Church Center app. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you soon.